Welcome to Flipping the Table. Today, Michael talks with Jim Kleinschmidt, CEO of Other Half Processing and the inspiring force behind the USDA-funded Growing Grass Climate Smart Commodities Partnership Project, for which Michael and Roots of Change are a partner. Recorded in early November at the Regenerate Conference in Santa Fe, they discuss how Jim's family and advocacy experiences led him to create a unique and thriving business that ensures full use of all the resources that come with cattle and bison, and how that work led to an amazing five-year project to bring 1,000 more ranchers into the regenerative world by opening high-value fashion markets in Europe and beyond for hides and more. Enjoy the show. Grasslands are underappreciated in our world. They cover 40% of the Earth's land mass, they exist on every continent except Antarctica, and they are among the most beneficial ecological systems of the planet because the numerous plants that live in grasslands are like mini solar panels. They offer lots of sun-powered energy for an amazing array of above and below ground species. Grasslands provide many other ecosystem services, including water capture and infiltration, carbon sequestration, recreational space, and of course, meat production. Regenerative agriculture, which is a movement we've been focused upon because of its power to transform agriculture globally, depends on healthy grass and well-managed grasslands. Today, I converse with Jim Kleinschmidt. He was an organic farm kid that grew up to become an advocate for sustainable and organic agriculture, and then an entrepreneur that employs market forces to create change. Being an informed realist, Jim sees how farm policy can be an accelerant to the pace of system transformation. Jim is also all about honoring livestock through full use of the many resources their bodies provide. We explore how his other half processing hide business spawned the Growing Grass Project, which is not about the actual growing of grasses, but is in fact dependent upon grasslands for production of bison and beef from regenerative ranching operations. The capitalized word grass in the Growing Grass Project title is actually an acronym that stands for get this, Generalized Regenerative Agriculture Sourcing Specification. The overarching goal of growing grass is to increase the value and production of regeneratively grazed beef and bison in ways that benefit U.S. farmers, ranchers, market partners, rural economies, and the climate. Growing grass is an innovative effort to allow thousands of ranchers to bring a diverse set of regenerative and organic certifications to one single, fully transparent supply chain servicing fashion companies seeking leather, pet product companies seeking chewables, fertilizer companies seeking bone meal, all this and more from verified regenerative ranching operations. Back in early 2002, Jim and his colleague Anna Strauss asked Roots of Change to join the GRASS team in development of the proposal that went to USDA requesting over $70 million. Well, we did not get our full request. We got $35 million. But our team was only one of 17 successful proposals out of the 500 submitted from across the nation. We now have five years to reach 1,000 producers with this opportunity to gain value from the full animal raised in a positive way. The vast majority of the funds will flow to the ranchers through cost sharing for their investments and incentive payments for their products, all aimed at achieving national climate goals. Roots of Change is just one part of the brain trust of organizers, scientists, technologists, and livestock enterprises implementing the project and thus advancing this regenerative agriculture movement that, in my view, is just really getting started. I see this project as a kind of experimental pilot program that could help shape new farm policies if we're successful. So Roots of Change is thrilled to be working with Jim and his team on growing grass. And let's begin, because I know you will find Jim's life and work inspiring. 
Jim Kleinschmidt, great to be with you here in Albuquerque, New Mexico during the Regenerate Conference. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Good to be here with you, Michael. Yeah. Actually, we have a lot of things we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about your journey around farming, regenerative agriculture. We're going to talk about your business, other half processing. And then we're going to, we're going to talk about the Growing Grass Project that we're working on together. Really want to uh, get into that and uh, the benefits that will accrue to all the regenerative producers out there. But let's start, like I always like to start, what's your origin story? Because you grew up on a farm in Nebraska. That's right. That's right. You know, my family uh, were dairy farmers, third generation on the land. My dad and mom had decided to just carry forward what my grandparents had been doing, dairy farm, hogs, multiple crop rotations. But they figured out pretty early in the 80s farm crisis that that wasn't going to work for the family. I mean, as I like to say, you know, we were dairy farmers eating government cheese. Mm -hmm. So if if the government has to give you your milk back to feed you, you're not doing anything too sustainable on a farm. So mom ended up doing a lot of work in the policy space, trying to figure out how we get better policy to support farmers, uh, to get better rural livelihoods. Dad focused more on kind of how do we change our farming system to to be more regenerative would be what we talk about today. At the time, we didn't call it that. We talked about sustainability, you know, but it was really how do we transition from this this form of farming that was more linear, you know, where we were doing all the work for the cows to shifting over to how do you let the cows do the work? And that was really the beginning of our regenerative journey. And that was back in the 80s. You know, dad started figuring out how to, you know, he started learning about holistic resource management. Uh, he worked with a, a leader in the space called Terry Gompert, who was one of the founders of the Grass Fed Exchange and you know, a real early leader in this space. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we transitioned our farm um, from a dairy farm to a grass fed beef farm and an organic crop operation. And it's now been organic certified, the farm has for over 30 years. Wow. Pioneers. Yeah, they were really early. So we we're lucky to grow up in that family where, you know, they taught us by showing us. But of course, you know, if you start a dairy farm, uh, you're encouraged to run away. And our parents, of course, encourage us to go to school either way. But when your first job's your hardest and least worst paying, it's pretty easy to go away. So I went up to Minnesota um, and ended up going to St. Olaf College. Uh, thought nice I was place. It was a great place and thought I was going to go. I was a history guy always. So I got excited about what's happening with Russia and Eastern Europe right at that point in the Soviet Union. I ended up doing Russian and Soviet studies, spent some time in Eastern Europe, Mm -hmm. Uh, thought that would be my world. Two weeks after I graduated, I was on the ground in Moscow and Lithuania in 93 Mm. and uh, stayed with a farm family in Lithuania where we were doing rural development work with them, distributing seed, uh, medical supplies, doing work with uh, helping set up FFA visits. But talking to the family there, I, you know, it came pretty clear that they saw the problems with global agriculture that we were seeing in the U.S., yet it was really originating from the U.S. And they were like, well, why are you here? Why aren't you home working on it? Ah, interesting. Yeah, and I didn't have a good answer. I'm like, you're right. And so I came home uh, and ended up going back to Minnesota where I um, went to meet Mark and Neil Ritchie mm-hmm. from the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, who were friends of our family from the farm crisis movement. And, and we should just say for a second that Mark was an incredible uh, early pioneer in the whole area around uh, farm policy change, the need to change farm policy. hundred percent. He was such a visionary. I mean, I know in California, he was one of the early leaders in yep. the organic egg industry yeah. too, and in helping right. organic farming going. Yeah. Right where I live. I mean, uh, at Petaluma and he was uh, down in Santa Clara County. Yeah. Exactly. Amazing. No, he's a global leader. And we were, I was really fortunate to be hired and be, you know, to end up working for them over almost 20 years total between, you know, the time I spent as staff and as a consultant for them. And so, yeah, started working there, uh, did things around farming, nutrient management, still decided I had to go back to school for, uh, to finish my degree, work in Russian and Baltic studies. So I went up to Seattle to the University of Washington uh, at the end of the 90s, but went home and farmed for a year after that and figured out I kind of wanted to stay in the U.S. and keep working on these agricultural issues, but with an international perspective. Mm-hmm. So went back to the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy in 2001 and worked as a full-time staff there until 2015. I founded the Rural Communities Program. We did work around climate change, agriculture, and really continuing to focus on what are the new markets that are emerging that can you know, really support and reward farmers and ranchers for doing the right thing with the land and the animals. And then how does that, how does that benefit the communities they're in? Mm-hmm. So that was the focus of my work for many years there. But you know, as time got on, I, I saw other things that needed to be done and I, I decided I wanted to go do some things for myself. So I started to consult for ITP, for some foundations, Aveda, a few others in this space and grass-fed companies. And that's mm-hmm. where I kind of came back to 
Back okay. to home. So yeah, that's interesting. So I know, uh, talk a little bit about your brother, Mark, because yeah. he took a, a, a different path, but you guys have ended up coming together to to launch your business. And I want to talk actually uh, also about your poultry business that you also started, because it's interesting. You, you started out as a history major. You went into pol- the policy world and ec- rural economic development, but you've ended up being an entrepreneur. And so that's an interesting little thing. So I want you to talk about that transition and then your brother. Yeah. Well, I feel like, you know, and we've talked about this before, Michael, that, you know, I feel like a lot of the work in, a, in this nonprofit space is really startup work. Mm-hmm. Um, you're asked to create projects to address specific problems. Really, that's what you do. You, you create a proposal, you put together the project, and you try to, uh, you know, you implement it. And that's kind of a startup business. So we had a lot of training in that without really knowing it. Um, and I've always been kind of, I, I like to do things, not just think. And so... Uh, I was part of our coffee company's board, Peace Coffee, which you know IATP had owned and founded. It was the first fair trade coffee company in the U.S. So I got some real experience and knowledge about a sustainable business from that, from being part of that organization. And then what we saw was I started to see these issues around grass fed and hides. And while we really valued the meat, including from our family, we were selling it. Um, me and my brothers and my sister were all selling it into the different places we lived. We you were also, the marketing arm of the family. We were the marketing arm. It helps to be in the cities when you're when your farms in the country. So I was in Minneapolis, or so two of my brothers. Mm-hmm. Uh, my older brother Mark's in Chicago, and my my sister Julia lives down in the Vermilion area. Mm-hmm. And so we were all able to sell to we, we all carried beef to our communities where we lived. But we also saw the challenges and the costs associated with getting that direct marketed beef processed and and what we got back versus you know what you could get in the conventional market Mm -hmm. and what we knew from those businesses where there was a problem with the rest of it the other half and uh, we call it other half because we're really talking about anything besides the meat. Mm-hmm. Um, it's that's called, the name of your company, and other that, half processing. And that's what we named our company as other mm-hmm. half processing. And this is something I started with my brother, Mark, as you mentioned. Mark is one year older. We milked cows together. We did all the farming together. He ran off to school too. Um, he, he went to McAllister in Minnesota first, but then continued on and got his PhD in physics. Wow. And went into the uh, kind of the, the bigger business world. He was, you know, he went through a company, one of the international companies, uh, Avery Dennison mm-hmm. in one of their divisions and was working his way through. They put him through business school. He got a master's at the Kellogg School in Chicago and, and was really getting a lot of training in the space. So as I was seeing these issues around, you know, not valuing the other half and I was starting to think about starting this company, Mark was the first person I turned to, of course, for business advice. And quickly he saw that this was something that gave him more passion than, than the other work he was having. So he joined me in it when we founded it back about seven years ago now. Wow. So yesterday we you, you were giving a talk to a group of ranchers uh, about the Growing Grass Project. And one of the things that you mentioned, one of the things that really struck me was the statistic about how how many hides go into the waste system in our country into landfills? Why yeah. don't you just tell people that? that Because that, that right there was so stark about why you need to do, why you need to form the company. Yeah, I know exactly. I mean, this and this is something that's kind of recent. I mean, so to be clear, we bring our animals for processing for the meat, right? It's always about the meat that we're getting. But there's these bu- things that come off with the meat. And either they get used or they get thrown away. And hides have traditionally, of course, been really valuable because we need them for leather. We use them for collagen and other things. And so the markets used to always be good, and it was a big part of the processor's income. But in the last 10 years, the price has dropped really precipitously for hides to the point where the value was so low that the companies that used to come and pick them up and buy them from these meat processors, some of them started uh, stopped doing it. Or they started charging a disposal fee per hide for them to pick them up and take them away. And we're at a point now in the world where 40% of uh, beef hides are thrown away into landfills for, or burned. Insane. Yeah. And in the U.S., it's that's probably gre- at least 20%. That's, greenhouse, that's a greenhouse gas emission. 100%. It's a full emission. And again, by not using that hide, we're not saving anything. It's that, that animal still being processed. It's about a weight. And now it's become a waste product of something of use. So we knew that was horrible honestly and it didn't it didn't reflect the care the farmer rancher takes with those animals it doesn't respect that animal and all the things that we're doing so for us how do we increase how do we get to full utilization valuation respect for these animals well it's by using all the parts and using them in the right way yeah that's interesting so your your poultry business was that before or after 
uh, or at the same time? It was kind of at the same time. So um, I, I'm fortunate to call Reginaldo Haslam Mark and one of my older friends. We had started back at ITP, you know, 20 plus years ago, and we were a couple of the farm kids in the room. Um, and we stayed in touch always. I always, I was so impressed with his vision, his vision in general, uh, and, and his story, and who he is. And and so as he started to move forward and think about the regenerative poultry-centered agricultural systems that he was leading, we knew we needed to have a business that really led that work. Finally, we had nonprofit partners. We had a lot of folks helping grow education, knowledge, testing things. But we needed a company to lead it in the market. Now, but the goal was to to show people how poultry can be part of a regenerative system and produce better chicken? 100%. This is, you know, and the idea was we know chicken is one of the most valuable and once accessible, you know, kind of livestock for farmers and ranchers to grow. It's relatively affordable to get. It's a short lifespan relatively. It's good for producers, particularly young producers just starting. Exactly. It's something you can get into relatively easy, but we knew it needs to be part of a system to be regenerative. Chickens in, in barns, not going outside or if they go outside into dirt, open dirt fields is not humane. It's not regenerative. And what Ray he knows coming from Guatemala and his study of agronomy is that chickens are jungle birds. Mm-hmm. So they belong in the trees. Mm-hmm. So we created tree range farms where we put the chickens back in the trees. But it's a great name, by the way, tree range, range farms. Yeah, I came up with that when we were meeting one time and it was really based on Ray he explaining in Spanish, it was all about forest chickens. And I'm like, you know, I think you, you mean tree range chickens. And he said, oh, mm. that's what we got to. Well, you know, I just want to say this aside. I live in Santa Rosa, California, and I live kitty corner from a farm supply store. Mm. Seven and a half years ago, a chicken escaped from there, came to my house, and has been living in my tree <laughs> ever since, seven and a half years. There you go. Uh, it is a tree animal. You're t- totally true. And I watch her. She goes to the tree to, at night or during the day just to rest, but then she's out you know, wandering around eating. But I, I really started to understand for the first time what the real life cycle of a chicken is just by watching that. That's fantastic. And that's an old chicken too. Yes, seven um, and a half years. Yeah. Unbelievable. No, and that's really the system is how do you mimic natural systems for the animals? Give them the life they're supposed to have. And, and obviously we manage it. So our forest, our jungle is hazelnuts, elderberries. It's, it's nut crops. It's food crops for us and for the farmers. The chickens pay the bills. You support the chickens. You raise chickens. They make you enough money. They are the start of the energy, as it were. You're mm-hmm. feeding them, and then they feed the trees and everything. So we're, we're energy managers, as Ray, he likes to say. We're not producers. We don't produce anything. Mm-hmm. We just manage energy flows on the farm. But the way it's done with the chicken, with tree range, is really to make it work on the chicken level and then make those crops, those perennial crops really work and continue to be another source of income. So we really start to get multiple sources of good income for these farmers on small plots of land as we reforest farms. Okay. So this is interesting. Talk about the brand, where people could get it if they're interested, how, how that would happen. Yeah. Yeah. So tree range is really just getting up and running. We're in Minnesota primarily. There are going to be some national outlets showing up pretty soon. Uh, Blue Nest Beef is one place that has been a partner from the beginning and they do shipping. Our goal is to really grow in the Minnesota, Wisconsin, you know, upper mm-hmm. Midwest area, but then start to set up in other areas as it's well. It's a regional brand though. It's, that's the, at, the actually, uh, at this point, it's a regional focus. and it's seasonal. Uh-huh. So we really only raise the chickens when they can be outside. So in oh. Minnesota, that's not very long. Right. And so our goal is to grow this beyond. We do have, I mean, we're, we're, we're growing as a company. It's, you know, we have investment opportunities for folks. So if people are interested, it's something that's really of interest. Um, you know, if people want to help grow Tree Range, there's ways to do it. You can go to Tree Range and see ways you can help us hatch the company. Mm-hmm. Go to treerange.org or, or treerangefarms.com. 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 And people can invest. Okay, cool. Yep. Or, or they can just show their way to support it too. Okay, good. Yeah. So that's a fascinating story into itself. And we could, and as the company grows, maybe we'll have another conversation about that. So let's go back to Other Half Processing, how it started, how you've built it, where you are, and then we'll start talking about growing grass. While we were working on tree range, like I said, I was doing some consulting with some of the grass-fed companies, and I was working with specifically Thousand Hills Cattle Company and in based in Minnesota, and then Lawrence Meats, which is in Cannon Falls, and is really one of, if not the leading meat processor in the country. They were, you know, they were the glass abattoir in Michael Pollan's uh, Omnivore's Dilemma, mm-hmm. if people have read that. So Mike and Rob Lawrence are wonderful. They do a lot of this custom slaughter, and so. We were having conversation between them, Matt Meyer, the owner and chief rancher and renegade of Thousand Hills, 
and we were talking about literally this point of, of this loss of value for these other parts, and specifically hides, where um, Lawrence Meets had had trouble. You know, the cost, had, you know, the value had dropped for them like everyone else. And I said, you know, someone has to do something about this. We have to try this. Can we try it with you guys? Because what we had there was we knew which farmers and ranchers were bringing livestock in for Thousand Hills, and we knew when they came into Lawrence. So I show up with my pickup that day when they come in, we have the number of hides, we grab the hides from the meat processing plant and we drive them to a tannery in Milwaukee. Mm. Um, and we start work that way where we, we find a place that would actually start to do the preservation for us and the tanning. And then luckily, just as we're starting to, to test this out on the ground, uh, we met Zach Angelini from Timberland. And Timberland had just started... Timberland Shoes. Timberland Shoe Company, exactly, yeah. a part of the VF company. Mm -hmm. um, they had just started their journey around regenerative and were really excited about trying to figure out if they could make their leather supply a regenerative leather supply. So we were so fortunate to meet Zach that early and they worked with us, as we say, to, to rebuild their leather supply from the farm up. Wow. And we went from hauling, you know, in the back of my pickup to start hauling to Milwaukee in a trailer. And pretty soon uh, we started adding other slaughter plants around the country to the point where we were up to over almost 30,000 hides we were collecting in a year, about a year, year and a half ago. Wow. So we're going to go back to the, to the company, uh, the evolution of the company, but I want you to tell people about what it takes to create a hide that could be of great value? Because I know yesterday you were talking about the process and the importance of the slaughterhouse's role and then getting it to the tannery. So that was an interesting piece that people, I think, would value understanding. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I think for us, we have to start where, where the value starts, which is really we only work with hides from regeneratively raised animals. And talk about what you mean by that. Yeah, so for us that, you know, coming from a farm and from a background where we, you know, our family's been doing it for a long time, it was something a little intuitive to us, but, you know, for us to explain it simply, it's really, again, back to how, how do we mimic that natural life of the animal? These are animals that are ruminants, and a ruminant is really born and set up to eat grass and forage, not, which we cannot eat, which is the beautiful thing of all this, right? right. And so those animals are, are, should be eating grass. They shouldn't be being fed grain. So the starting point for us is how do, that we need cows, cattle, or bison to be 100% grass fed mm -hmm. throughout their life. And that means, again, forages, hay, things like that, but not being finished in a confined feedlot with grain to make them fatten up quickly. Uh, we, we prohibit confinement in that way. Obviously they can be in yards when the weather's you know not so great, mm -hmm. but we don't keep them in a confined space. They have to be out on pasture in an open space. Mm -hmm. That's the key thing. But then beyond that, just being grass fed isn't really enough. There's ways to do grass fed that aren't regenerative. And so for us, it's how do you graze those animals? Cause that's really the core of regenerative. Regenerative is really at the end of the day about the soil and the organisms that live there. And how do you grow them? because those grow everything else for all of us. And so for us, it's how, and the cows- It's that energy management thing again. It is, and this time, instead of the chickens managing the energy, it's the cows. Mm -hmm. And the cows are amazing at managing energy tied to photosynthesis of grass, and to, to, in, in a way that when they graze the grass and, and it grows and the roots grow down, we're actually, they're able to support carbon dioxide being taken out of the atmosphere, transferred through those grasses into the soil. We call it carbon sequestration, but it's a way to, you know, to literally fight climate change through cows. And so as, as many of our folks say, it's not the cow, it's the how. Right. Um, and this is the how. Nickel it, huh? Exactly. <laughs> right. Exactly. And yeah. it's an amazing way to think about it because these, you know, cows can, can be problematic in our system in an industrial confined way. But when we're talking about regeneratively grazed, they actually are part of the solution 100%. So those are the key things, 100% grass fed, regenerative grazing that maintains or increases soil of carbon and organic matter. And then, you know, biodiversity protection, animal welfare, those key things are, are our main criteria for the, for the livestock and for the farmer rancher who raised them. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have criteria for the buyers. Mm -hmm. We think it's, it's worth, both sides should be throwing in on this deal. It shouldn't always just be obligations on our farmers and ranchers. And so buyers have to be willing to pay more more than a commodity price. These folks are doing, a, are doing a lot of work to show how they're raising these animals in a verified regenerative way. They should get more than a commodity price for that work and for that effort. And we need that market to be open to all. We know that you know, historically a lot of communities have been kept out of these markets or, not, or kept off the land under farm policy and other kinds of you know, discrimination that's happened in our country around agriculture. To us, regenerative, ha knowing it comes from indigenous knowledge, 
and it celebrates indigenous knowledge, we have to be inclusive of all folks. And, and diversity is one of the other principles of regenerative. So we need a diverse supply chain that really brings folks who have been, who've been kept out back into the space and, and into the value and wealth creation that comes with it for mm -hmm. everyone. So you've talked about the need for the, the buyers to recognize the value. And that, that also requires that you're producing a quality product. Right. So let's go back to the, how do you yeah. preserve these hides? And then we'll get into the other elements, the other pieces of the other half. Sure, sure. Yeah, so exactly. So the starting point is just, yeah, how is that animal raised? But now they come into a processing plant and there, you know, they end up being put into pieces, as it were. Right. And the pieces, you know, the meat is taken off and is put into the boxes for the, for the meat company that's part of this, the farmer rancher or the, or the company that's, that works with a group of farmers and ranchers. For us, the hide has to come off in a way that has the least amount of cuts. So our goal is really that it comes off in a one good piece. And then it, it's preserved right away. They're, they're very fragile, actually. You need to have them chilled right away. And then you need to get them into salt or some other sort of preservation mechanism. And so that can be done, at, that's often done at the slaughter plants themselves, or there's companies that pick up the hides still and will do that preservation. And our job is to make sure they have the hides from the animals we're working with and that those get into that preservation and then get moved on to the tannery in a timely So way. you have to have an identity system from the cattle through the hide. That's correct. Uh -huh. And so that, we, it's not a brand though. You were talking about yesterday, the fact that brands lower the value of a hide. Yeah, there's, there's all kinds of uh, differences, right? Obviously a brand takes up a piece of the skin and so it, it brings lower value. Now, you know, Western farmers and ranchers are needed. Many states still require branding. So that's part of it. But yeah, there's a difference between, you know, how, which different animals there are all slightly different pricing available for that. Mm -hmm. But for us, the, you know, what's interesting is in the regenerative space, we have a diversity of cattle. We don't get the same. I mean, the it's same not all Angus. Black, black, it's not all black, black Angus. Angus. Exactly. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so that's part of the work with our buyers. Heritage breeds. Heritage breeds. We have all different kinds, all different sizes. And so that's part of, we have a more diverse set of hides coming out. And our buyers have to recognize that. And they do. They see that it's a little different. It's not what they're used to. And so they have to figure out how to work with these hides in a way that gets the value out of them as well. That's interesting because it reminds me of the, the problem of industrialization, making everything the same, which destroys diversity, which is against the principles of nature, actually. So what you're saying is you're trying to take these big industrial companies that buy hides and re-educate them around the, the fact of diversity because a lot of these small producers are using cattle that are best adapted for the region in which they're farming and ranching. That's right. That's right. And that's what we explain. And they're, they're outside. You know, they, they are based on the weather. They don't get a, a ration of corn, no matter what, the same amount. So, so their weight, their size, everything is more variable because they live that natural life. They also end up with scratches on them uh, from rubbing up against a tree. They get bug bites. They get things like that. All of that shows up as what we call character on the hide, but it does change it. And so we love working with the companies where they come in like a chef has done with food. Instead of saying, I'm going to make this, this meal no matter what, and you just give me the ingredients, they instead look at the ingredients and say, this is what, this is what I can make with these ingredients. And that's what we love with designers. How I can express materials. what the ingredient is. Exactly. You start at the ingredient and say, I want to make this bag or this shoe out of this. I don't, I'm not going to just make what we always make because this has different character. It has different, it's telling me to make something different. And we know that from chefs that that really has worked with local food. We see the same kind of thing with designers and material buyers in the, in the leather space. We hope you're enjoying the conversation. If you are, please rate our podcast and offer a review. Your voice will help us grow our listener base, which helps us sustain the funding to share these conversations with the people and organizations shaping a more just and regenerative future. A future in which the food and farm businesses are helping to solve the largest challenges of our time. One of the things when I first spoke with you about the Growing Grass Project, one of the things that really impressed me is the markets you're developing with other half processing. Talk about who you are serving in terms of supply. Yeah, so like I said, we started with Timberland. They were a great first partner. They really helped get us up and running with, with their leather company, ISA Tantec. And it's really critical to work with those folks. We talk about the brands at the end, but it's the tanneries and the folks in between 
who really figure out this leather, the help missing us. missing middle. Yeah, and we needed them. And they were, they've, they're great partners and working with us still to this day. We work with other tanneries too, though. We love the, Amer- the, we don't have a lot of tanneries left in the US, but there's some amazing multi-generational ones. One is Horween in Chicago. One is Herman Oak in St. Louis. Those are a couple we love. Herman Oak, we were talking to a rancher yesterday about how they are they are the most famous saddle makers, right? Or yeah, suppliers they are. of... Yeah, Leather. bridal and other kind of saddleware, they are it when you talk. Mm-hmm. And this is this is fifth generation mm-hmm. company in St. Louis that's been doing this that long. And they are they are that. And they were the very one of the very first companies we worked with. And so we love working with all these companies. But then at the end of the day, the brands are really what drives it. So like I said, we started with Timberland, but we're lucky to soon meet Coach on Tapestry, the company that owns Coach. We've now been working with Ralph Lauren as well. And then we have some other bigger companies we're, we're starting to work with. But we, of course, work with small brands too. We work with a great startup company company called Range Revolution, Kate Havstead out of Oregon. Yeah. She makes beautiful bags and stuff. And that's all made with leather that we've sourced with her. Um, so that's beautiful. Yeah. So, so you're creating a business in Oregon, right? So she's building another ecosystem of business and, and jobs and wealth creation. No, exactly. And she's a rancher herself. So she understands the full story. And, and this is our goal is that we, we, can, we can provide this, this leather with a story, this regenerative story, but also these farmer stories to whoever needs it. And we obviously the big businesses are great partners, but we love the small startups Artisans. who are really focused on this. The ones who are starting from a regenerative mindset rather than bringing it into their supply chain. So yeah, our goal is to be able to supply all these kinds of businesses as partners. Mm-hmm. So the demand is big. Let's talk about now, let's, let's transition into this, the reason why you started thinking about a growing grass project and took advantage of the USDA's invitation to apply for large grants for supply chain development. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So, you know, Mark and I were growing this business, right, already. And, and we knew from Timberland and others that they love the story, but at the end of the day, one of the key things they needed to understand was the climate value, right? How much, what we talked about earlier, when we talk about how much are those cows really helping fight climate change? How much are they get, helping the, through the grass management get carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere into the soil? Because there's a lot of studies out there that start to say that if we do this right, if we're managing those cows right, we end up, their actual life is carbon negative, right? Mm-hmm. They, they sequester more carbon the way they graze than is emitted through their life, which is amazing, right, for all of us. And that is one of the primary- Because it's counter needs. to what many of the big greens are saying about cattle. Yeah, instead of cattle being the right. issue, right, where we know with their methane from when they're burping, from right. eating that grass and di- digesting that grass, that's a, that is a, a greenhouse gas, clearly. Mm-hmm. But they aren't talking about the offset that can happen when those cows are on the right, are on grass in pasture. Versus in a feedlot that's being based on corn that's grown with tons of fossil fuels and chemicals and all the things that emit. And linear, I mean, right. at the end of the day, that's really right. the key. We're back to how we started. You know, we, we would go plant the crops, take care of the crops, harvest the crops, collect the crops, put them in a trough, put them in a wagon, put them in a trough for a cow. That's a lot of work. There's a lot of inputs there. And then the cow doesn't do anything other than eat it and- Right, stand there. Yeah, exactly. So this is really where we need to go with this. So we knew we were already doing something that was recognized as uh, climate friendly. And we had a marketplace set up under this because we had to figure out a sourcing specification that would work. Mm -hmm. And what we knew is there's a lot of great verification and certification systems out there already focused on grass fed, on humane, some of them on a regenerative now, but all different ones that at the end of the day, mostly we're looking at the same things we've talked about around 100% grass fed, around managed grazing, around soil and, and the amount of carbon in that soil. How do you measure it? And so for us, rather than say we one of these certifications is what we want or create our own certification that needs someone to show up on the farm or ranch to be verified, we instead say, how about we work with these existing verifications, these folks who are already showing up on the farm. Partner with them. Yeah, partner with them and use the information they're collecting for our system as well. And we call that the generalized regenerative 
agriculture sourcing specification. Grass. Say that again. Generalized regenerative agriculture sourcing specification. That means that's spelled as grass. Yeah. So that was grass and that was the way we worked. So if I wanted to bring, uh, you know, some new farmers or ranchers into our supply chain, we'd ask, are you verified under American Grass Fed Association? Are you mer- verified under Savory Institute's, you know, Land to Market. Land to Market or, you know, Environmental Outcome or Ecological Outcome EOV. Verification. Yep. EOV. Are you a Greener World Verified? Are you do you get ROC? Yeah. Are you under GAP even? Mm-hmm. Do you get humane? Do you already have tell what welfare? people what GAP is? GAP is Global Animal Partnership, which is tied to Whole Foods kind of uh, mm-hmm. uh, animal welfare criteria. But it's something that a lot of producers have if they want to be selling into Whole Foods. So that's an inspector showing up on your farm. That same inspector can be doing grass fed verification and other things too. So from our history as a family where we've worked with certification long, we knew we could partner with these folks rather than have to compete with them. Mm -hmm. And now farmers and ranchers have that market they're already in under regenerative organic certified, any of those that works best for their family, for their operation, but they're also in grass that way where we can take all of the byproducts from all of these different verified farms and have them in one supply chain with the same claim for our apparel company. So they know all of it is meeting the same criteria around a regenerative. Okay. So uh, I'm going to stop you there because I want to, I want to back up a little bit to get us to the opportunity that the USDA put out and then how that feeds into you building this system. Yeah. So uh, folks may be aware, but you know, USDA has finally decided, they, they decided about two years ago that it was really important to get agriculture into this climate smart space. We knew globally this is becoming a priority. We see it with the SEC, you know, idea around investor owned companies having to report on their scope three and other emissions, which is supply chain. So a lot of things been coming down the pike. USDA put $3 billion into a program to support climate smart commodity production, research, testing, a grant program. And we saw this and realized, you know, it was really what was key about is how do you both validate the climate smartness of production of these commodities, but then how do you really get markets established to sell them at that value that benefits farmers, ranchers, and rural communities in the process? And we're like, wow, we have the market. Under our grass system, we are already buying and selling products that are climate smart commodities. The hides are a commodity, so are the other byproducts. We're buying these from farmers and ranchers and processors and getting more value in the marketplace for them under the grass system. So the idea there was we have the market ready. We should apply for this because what we saw was the opportunity to grow it and to address some of the, some of the, challenges that we've encountered in there around, you know, some of the, pro- how hard it is for some of these small plants to do processing of hides and byproducts well, how hard it is for, um, to collect some of these things from remote, smaller locations. You know, how do we help communicate about regenerative all the way from processors through to apparel, pet food companies, all the others who use these byproducts from meat processing. So there's a lot of challenges other half processing had identified uh, while we were starting to work and grow, stand up our business and grow this market. Basically to pass the information all the way through the system. Yeah. How do we, how do we optimize the communication of this? Because we know consumers care. We know people through their food choices, through their pet choices, through all of the research we're seeing, especially as you know the younger generations, they really care about things they can do to help with the climate. Because they want a future. They want a future. And, and especially when it comes back to these things where it ties back to their food. Mm-hmm. And, and really we are, you know, hides are part of their food selection. So for us, this was a great opportunity to grow it and to really get more resources to make this market work for everyone. Mm-hmm. So we were lucky. We went in uh, with our partner. We went, our partner, the American Sustainable Business Institute is the lead grantee on it. We, we partnered with them to apply and we were lucky to receive $35 million dollars uh, from this climate smart commodity program to grow grass, as we call it. And yeah. that's what brings us together. Yeah. Well, I want to say that that was a very interesting process when the grant was being written. Anna Strauss, Anna Strauss, who's a colleague in this project, your operations manager, reached out to myself and our team. I don't know. But what I was impressed with was how long it took to actually do a grant of that size, how many people were involved, how many letters we had to get, how much writing was done, so many iterations. But you delivered that grant and you were one of very few grant applicants that actually received the money. I mean, it was incredible. You you applied for 70 million almost. That's right. And and got 35. We met with some crew, another crew last night that were also, they applied for 68 and they got 35. I mean, 
everybody applied for a lot. Not everybody got what they asked for, but there's a huge amount of money funded out there now to, it's like a thousand flowers bloom to actually discover how this can happen in our country. That's right. And we're really excited about it. I mean, we're just launching the grant work. I'm honored to be the project administrator for it right. under through OHP. Um, but other for, half processing. Yeah, for other half processing. But yeah, I've got this amazing team starting with Anna Strauss, who helped write the grant with us, but then is really our operations and, mm-hmm. and reporting manager there. And the goal here is, like we said, how do we make this work for everyone with the strongest focus on farmers, ranchers, and livestock raising communities? So tell, tell people how much of that 35 million is going to flow to the, to the ranchers. Exactly. So out of 35 million, 18 million is going right back to the, to the producer communities. And that was really intentional because what we know is supply is going to be our largest constraint. So how do we get more animals, more acres, more people involved in regenerative grazing in a way that is verified and that we can get them more value in the market. And so the goal here is you know, bringing folks in, helping pay, paying them to be part of the research because farmers and ranchers are often researched, as I say, by people who are paid to research, um, but they don't often get the pay. So we're going to start by honoring their time and their involvement. Pay the ranchers for participating in research. Exactly. Wow, what a, I mean, uh, rare and great. Exactly. And, and the goal is really a diverse set. I mean, uh, one of our priorities is, is working with underserved communities. Uh, beef and bison are our focus areas. So we're, we're proud to be working with a number of Native American community partners in this. And our goal really, and, and our intent is over 25% or more of the funding goes to farmers and ranchers and, and folks from those communities that have historically been underserved in, in our American agricultural system. Black, Latino, and Native American. Yeah, primarily, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's also veteran, women, mm-hmm. beginning, right. our other ones, but but this is really the priority. How do we go back to that inclusivity? How do we how do we help folks be part of this new system and make sure they have the resources, the education, the relationships needed for that? And and most of those are found in their own communities, but how do we grow that resource base for them for them with in partnership is really the goal. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, half of it's for that, but part of it is market access. That's where a lot of the money we see One of the biggest obstacles, especially when you're beginning or smaller producer, is these verifications, these on-farm verifications cost money. To have someone come and and check that you're doing everything and to work with you to go through, you know, the things we ask. Some of them are quite expensive. Very expensive. And if you're only raising a few animals. Thousands. And you need to get a lot of money back in the market on a premium just to offset that cost. So we think climate smart grazing, regenerative grazing is good for the for the U.S. It's definitely good for our environment. We also think it's good for the economy. So like other programs in the Farm Bill, we see an opportunity to support people being in that market. So we're going to cost share. We're going to provide some funding to each of these producers to, to reduce the cost of that audit, that inspection on farm. So it becomes more affordable to be in a verified market. I, this piece of the project I really love because one of the Reach of Change's goals always has been to shift the subsidies of the U.S. government to the kinds of subsidies that create the environment and the economy and the rural regeneration that we want to see, rather than just paying the the conventional system to keep doing what it's doing. And this is a good example of that. Yep. And this is a working program, right? To be clear, this isn't just paying folks for, I mean, we love good conservation programs and other things that help producers do the right thing with the land in a way that Which are the smallest piece of the farm bill. Exactly. <laughs> but in this case, this is working, right? We're giving them market access that, that gets them value in the market. Because our goal is that the market does carry these kind of practices as much as possible. But we need policy to help leverage that. So this kind of help to get in the market access is a big one. We also see the potential to help with subsidies. You know, mm-hmm. We have a subsidy system in our agricultural system that really de-risks production for farmers across the board. To make sure there's a food supply that's affordable. That's really what that's about, right? That's the idea. That's the right. idea. That's right? the idea. Yeah, right. exactly. And and for us, we see, you know, if if we know the market should be returning more money for farmers and ranchers who raise these animals under regenerative manner, mm-hmm. then can we guarantee them some return for that, whether it's from the market or from the government? Right. And let me just stop you there because I, I, uh, I, I recently did a podcast with Will Harris, and he talks a lot about this, the fact that when he was ranching, producing animals conventionally, he knew he was going to make money every year because he was able to externalize tons of costs that were taking the wealth out of his community, destroying the environment underneath him, harming his cattle. But he was making a profit. So what you're talking about is trying to actually 
incorporate all the costs and still ensure that the farmer can make money because we're a capitalist system. If you don't make money, you're out of business. So we have to reincorporate those costs. So there has to be a higher price. And that's why we need subsidy to allow the food costs to be manageable. Yeah, it's, I mean, Will's exactly right. I mean, and, and he's one of the best people you can ever learn from in this whole system. He's really one of our leaders. But yeah, the idea is how do we, how do we help producers know that if they produce something this way, they're going to be okay. Mm-hmm. And that's what we do with the other subsidies. It really is because we want this to happen. We want people to do it regardless of some of the market pressures because we know it goes up and down, prices do. Right. So in this case, we- And now they're up. And now they're up. And, and, but for these byproducts and other things, we know if you can go to a pet food store, you can look at our, the leather and these things. These things are worth more. The meat is worth more. So how do we transfer that into a subsidy system that helps someone say, I can raise an animal that way and I know I'll make enough hopefully in the market, and that's mostly the case. But if not, I'll get some support to make my, myself whole. Right, a margin. Then, a margin, enough to keep going. Because as my dad says, you can't think green if you're in the red. Right, you can't think green if you're in the red. I love that. So I'm going to stop there again because I want you to talk a little bit about the, we have only talked really about hides. Yeah. Talk about the other products that come out of an animal because they're a ton. Yeah, no, I mean, and this is something that Native Americans certainly, but most folks knew until recently that an animal produces so much more than meat. You know, we have bones, we have all of the the organs, you know, the liver, the heart, the kidneys. These are nutrient rich and dense things to eat for us or for our pets. We've got sinews, we've got tendons, we've got esophagus. These are, most of these things are the kind of things that our pets love to chew on. And as we're a growing world of of fur babies, Mm -hmm. um, where people really, really care what their pets eat, even maybe more than themselves as research shows, this is one of those opportunities to, to get the good stuff rather than having more processed food, more processed treats, more plastic chews, are they going, they can be going back and having some of these products that utilize and value that the rest of that animal, but also are really good for their pets. So that's mm-hmm. one thing, mm-hmm. but there's collagen. We, you know, people are very much into collagen and gelatins now, mm-hmm. increasingly. That comes from the other parts of the animal. We have fertilizer products. We have so bone meal. There's so many things that can come out of these animals that could add, but that give us something, a valuable product in the market that is often now being replaced with something synthetic right. or, or highly processed, but it also gets more utilization and use out of that animal in a way that gets, can get more money back to the meat processors who are struggling and those small and medium-sized farmers and ranchers who are raising the animals. So for us, it's both sides. Our economy needs these products. The natural op- options that come out of these animals are often are usually superior to what's being produced in you know, artificial ways. Right. And, and we can get more back to the folks who have done the work to raise these animals in ways that benefit us all. And we totally honor the animal by using all of it. Exactly. Yeah. So um, that's all really positive and um, a wonderful story about what can happen. So let's just talk about the future. We have a few minutes left. Let's talk about the future. I mean, what's your vision of what's going to happen? This is a five-year grant. We're in the first few months. So there's a lot of time ahead to do a lot. So just describe what you hope to see happen over the next five years and where we'll be with this supply chain and this sector of the economy in five years? I think the key here is collaboration. You know, it really is. How do we bring the farmers and ranchers together with processors of meat and other byproducts, heights and other things, together with the market partners, the brands, the retailers, everyone involved? How do we turn this into a sector that is about abundance and then grows the value of these and understands how to communicate the stories of the farmers through to the brands, through to people who want to buy those things and want to support that kind of agriculture as consumers. And that's really what this is about. How do we test it together? So this grant's going to be so much fun because we have great partnerships in, among businesses, among academics and researchers, among aren't nonprofits. There, yeah, yeah. There are 14 partners. Is, is that right? Do we have 14 partners in this project? Can't remember. It's core organizational, but then you bring all the meat companies yeah. and processors and, all the and brands and ranches, and we're into the hundreds, yeah. literally. And so the goal is that this collaborative work that really shares information up and down and through the value web, because it's not a chain, right? right. There's, it's a, it's web. a network. Yeah. It's a network of groups. Ecosystem. That, that yeah. we work together to identify how we optimize the value, how we optimize the use, how we optimize 
the climate smart aspect of these regenerative animals. And again, climate smart is only one component, right? Regenerative includes animal welfare, animal it includes water, mm -hmm. it includes anim, human health and community. Mm -hmm. These are all pieces of what we're growing here. And at the end, what we want to see is not just is a market that that reflects and rewards this in a real clear way and knows how to talk about and communicate these values to humans all over the world, but also that we get policy support that matches this. Because once we see the value of this for the land, for farmers and ranchers, rural economies, all the way through, I want to make sure we have the right supports in place to keep it going. Um, and I think that's a big part of our, our, our grant is how- Making the case for policy changes. Yeah, the, in the right places. And again, mm -hmm. policy changes that support this market space, support mm -hmm. these producers doing what they want to do the way they do it well, which is raise these animals respectfully and regeneratively. Mm -hmm. So we're at the Regenerate Conference, which is the Kivera Coalition, American Grass-Fed Association, and uh, holistic management organization that grew out of the savory work. Those three are the sponsors of this conference that we're attending. Yesterday morning, Jeannie Carver who is a, a sheep and cattle and grain rancher in Oregon, Eastern Oregon, whom you introduced me to, mm -hmm. gave a talk that was incredible about what's happened on her property. And one of the things she talked about was the need, what you just said about the story, the fact that she, when she started getting into this business where she was selling hides for sheep, the companies that were buying had never met a farmer or rancher that were producing those hides. And what it meant for her to be connected to the artists and the companies. And you're doing that here as well. You're, and, and this is what Wendell Berry talks about. The fact that the modern industrial system broke down all the relationships. And what this is about is rebuilding relationship. And our country is suffering from this polarization which reflects the breaking of relationships. So this is actually part of the healing, the political healing, I feel, that this country needs by re- knitting the webs between the buyers, the artisans in the middle, and the producers of the products that people are buying in the elite coastal areas. But it's really coming a lot of it from the Midwest. And we're broken right now between the Midwest and the coasts. Yeah. And I mean, to me, it's just people strive for relations and, and, and connections. And we know this. We've seen it in the food world over and over again. People want to know who their farmers are. They love meeting farmers and ranchers and seeing where the food comes from. And, and it changes the taste. It changes their appreciation. We know that can happen with what they wear, what they feed their pets, all these other things as well. And it, it goes back to that connection. And what we see with farmers and ranchers is they, especially you know, the ones we work with, the slaughter plant workers and others, they are so excited about this reconnection and this recognition of what they do and the value of that product. When we tell them that hide coming off that cow is going to turn into some Timberland boots or a coach bag or, or a Range Revolution bag, they're like, really? Mm -hmm. They're like that, this is real. And they're so excited. And, mm -hmm. and I think a lot they're of it's valued. just, yeah. And well, it's recognition of their work and of mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a great starting point. If we want to talk about how we start rebuilding connections, let's start with respect. Yeah. Let's, let's start to respect each other's values because they're pretty tied together is what we find. It's not a, it's not a political thing. Mm -hmm. I don't see anyone who doesn't want to have that connection back to their food, back to the people who, who do that work and mm -hmm. are taking care of the land and the animals. Great. So just to close, I want to say that this is a five-year project. I would hope that on an annual basis, we could come back and have a conversation about what's developing, how this is moving along, where we are in the, in the journey, because it's a wonderful thing. And I want to thank you very much for including us and for having the idea, being the catalyst for something really important to happen in the country. And congratulations. No, oh, thank you, Mike. Well, we're glad to work with you. And be honest, this isn't this is not us alone. It, it came from a group and from a community, and, it, and it's going to only be grown by a community of people. So we're glad to have you and all of the ranchers, farmers, and meat companies, and everyone else as part of this group. And we're so excited to do the work. And absolutely, we'll check in with you. Great, thanks. Thank you for listening. Roots of Change is a program of the Public Health Institute. 